Hello, Hey Boomer community. My name is Wendy Green, and I'm your host for Hey Boomer. And Hey Boomer is a show for people that have already transitioned, that are looking at transitioning from their full-time careers, and they are concerned about what's next. How am I going to stay involved and relevant and engaged? And so our goal with Hey Boomer is to leave you after each show feeling inspired and engaged and relevant and knowing that there is a purpose for this next chapter of our life. I want to uh, thank our sponsor, Road Scholar. They are the not-for-profit leader in educational travel for boomers and beyond, offering expert-led adventures in 50 states and more than 100 countries. A few years ago, I went on a Road Scholar trip with one of my grandchildren. We went to Chincoteague Island, had an amazing time. They kept us adults involved. They kept the kids involved, a wonderful learning and bonding experience. And this summer, I'm going to Glacier National Park with Road Scholar, and I'm looking forward to the walks with the naturalists and learning so much about it. If you would like to learn more about Road Scholar and some of their national park trips, um, which is just part of what they offer, but that's my thing, uh, you can go to road, R-O-A-D, scholar.org slash heyboomer. So be sure and check out our Road Scholar sponsor. Today we are talking about Randy Kay's newest book, Happier Made Simple, Choose Your Words, Change Your Life. I read her book the first time a couple of months ago because, you know, I get books from these authors, I read them, and then I move on to the next one, and I'm making notes, and but, you know, I have to read it ahead of time to get it done. Well, I loved it then, but I had moved on. And the, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I hit a personal crisis, and I just felt like I needed to look at Randy's book again. And it was so helpful. So I just, I'm so excited about having her on. And I wanted to encourage all of you to be able to pick up a copy of her book. And we'll talk about that um, more, but it's happier made simple. You can find it on Amazon. You can find it on Barnes and Noble. And the thing I really love about this book is that it's so realistic. It's not one of those pie in the sky, feel happy all the time kind of things. It really does admit that life can be hard. And, you know, there are some tools that she shares with us that can help us move through some of those hard times. So Randy Kay is focusing on reinvention rather than retirement. Go Randy. As they say, the possibilities are endless. She has two best-selling books, Happier Made Simple, which we'll talk about today, and Ben Behind His Voices. And those are tied into her work as a motivational speaker, a radio and podcast host. She also is an actress, a singer, a teacher, a mental health advocate, as well as a wife, mother, and grandmother. Life balances key and a key to being happier. On the serious side, Randy speaks to groups of doctors, nurses, medical students, families, providers, and legislators regarding the family experience when mental illness hits. And you'll learn why that is part of her um, mission. But before I bring Randy on, you know, I want to promise you my never too old stories. So first story, James Earl Carter Jr. You all remember him as the 39th president of the United States from 1977 to 1981. While he was president, he pardoned all Vietnam War draft evaders. He established two cabinet departments, the Department of Energy and the Department of Education. He pursued the Camp David Accord, bringing together Israel and Egypt and the strategic arms limitation talks. The final years of his presidency were marked by the Iran hostage crisis, the 1979 energy crisis, the Three Mile Island nuclear reactor accident, the Nicaraguan revolution, and the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. It was tough times then. 
<clears throat> his post-presidential activities have been more favorable, though. He established the Carter Center in 1982 to promote and expand human rights. He has traveled extensively to conduct peace negotiations, monitor elections, and advance disease prevention and eradic eradication in developing nations. Carter is a key figure in the charity Habitat for Humanity, and he received the Nobel Peace Prize in 2002 for his humanitarian work. At 97 years old, Jimmy Carter is both the oldest living and longest lived president, and he still is occasionally involved. Just this past week, he filed an amicus brief in the longstanding legal dispute over efforts to build a road through the remote refuge in Alaska. Still engaged. I'm so inspired by that. My second story is about the Pulitzer Prize, which is awarded for journalism, for books, music, and drama. And this, the prizes were recently awarded. Established in 1917, the Pulitzer Prize, which is administered by New York's Columbia University, is the most coveted award for journalists across the world. The award is to honor exceptional achievements in journalism, be it in newspaper, magazine, online journalism, literature, and musical composition. The Pulitzer Prize is named after the Jewish-Hungarian-born American newspaper publisher, Joseph Pulitzer. In 1904, seven years before his death, Pulitzer drew up a will that made provisions for the establishment and the endowment of the Pulitzer Prize. A whopping $2 million in 1904 was given to Columbia University in New York to establish a school of journalism and for the prizes. Some of the winners this year included the Washington Post, the staff of the Miami Herald, journalists from the Tampa Bay Times, Jennifer Senior of The Atlantic, and a special citation to the journalists of Ukraine. I selected the Pulitzer Prize as a never too old story because continuing learning is a foundation for the Hey Boomer community for living an engaged, meaningful life. And I encourage you to take advantage of the myriad of articles and performances that are available to us today. And with that, I'm going to introduce you all to Randy. Hello. Hello. Hi, welcome to Hey Boomer. Thank you. I love your never too old stories. Aren't they so inspiring? Yeah. They're so inspiring. Can I share one too, quickie? Please. I just read about Rhea Perlman, who played Carla on Cheers, a big career, a big career. And uh, she is appearing in something streaming. I don't know. But anyway, she had to play a magician. Oh. And rather than having sleight of hand be a hand close up with someone else, she had to learn magic at the age of 74. How and cool. I just read this in Parade Magazine, I think. I don't know. Wherever I read it, it, it always stays with me when someone past the age of 70 is learning something brand new. So <sighs> she said it took longer than it would have taken when I was 24, but a magician came to her house 40 times wow. until she practiced enough to learn the magic. And I'm, <laughs> I'm, it's not a Pulitzer Prize, but I'm very inspired by that. Absolutely. <laughs> And we keep learning. You know, my mother is 90, almost 92, and she still is learning. So, yes. So let's start, Randy, with mm -hmm. why you felt that it was important to write a book on being happier. Okay. And by the way, I am so happy that you are finding the book even better the second time around, and especially that it's helping you through a tough time. Because I wrote the book for two reasons. One is that my first book has to do with the development of schizophrenia in my son. He is still alive and it's a game of shoots and ladders living with someone with schizophrenia, but he has had some success. There is always hope. We're having a tough week. I'm not going to lie, but he's still here. And I wrote a book about the family experience and the subtitle is One Family's Journey from the Chaos of Schizophrenia to Hope. And 
that book came out 10 years ago, although I just released the audiobook sequel kind of as a as an updated version. It's coming out soon. But in speaking to all those doctors and nurses and families about that and about some other challenges I've had, people kept saying, God, but you have such a good energy. How do you stay so positive? I'm like, well, I, I just tell myself different stuff from what I used to tell myself. And they're like, well, what do you tell yourself? <laughs> I've had, you know, I bought happiness books and I put them on the shelf and I don't remember what they said, or I bought a happiness book and it was too complicated, or um, they tell me to meditate and I can't do that, or the bunch of things. And I just thought, you know, I I'm going to take everything I've learned and try to make it accessible and memorable and funny and real and realistic. And so I took things like mindfulness and acceptance and humor, which is probably the extra spice that a lot of happiness books don't have. And I made an acronym called BREATHE, and each stands for a concept, and each concept has a catchphrase. And that's why I wrote it. I wrote it for the people who never finish a happiness book. Yeah. And there's a ton of them. You're right. And that was one of the things I love about yours. It's not like, oh, you have to sit there and meditate. You know, you have to be like practicing mindfulness all the time. It's very realistic. So let's tell the audience what the BREATHE acronym is, and we'll dive into each of them deeper, but give them the acronym. Okay. I even had mugs made up with them Ooh. on there. Ooh, there they are. So I can read it right <laughs> off the mug. Uh, and happy or made simple. The seven core phrases are the seven core concepts, which spell out breathe. And I know in an acronym, you're not supposed to have two letters the same, but it works for me. <laughs> so B is for being. Other people call it mindfulness. And this is very, very spoken about and very much written about. The phrase that helps me remember mindfulness is just be here now. There are other phrases. That's mine. Be here now. I didn't make it up, but I probably say that to myself 20 times a day and it helps center and ground me. R is for reality. This is something I use when I start to feel sorry for myself or worried about my son's condition or any other things that I wish were different, but won't be different. And that phrase is, it is what it is. The E, the first E in breathe is for engagement. We're all connected is the catchphrase and some something to remember. When the driver in front of you, the light turned green and he wouldn't go, or any of those times where we tend to divide to conquer, to remember that we're all connected. Otherwise, we wouldn't have run out of toilet paper during COVID and to have respect and value for everyone and find common ground as the way to conflict resolution. And also in this days, the value of you know, I was watching the first 10 minutes of you uh, and I'm like, ah, oh, oh, we want to meet her in person one day and sit down and have a cup of tea or a <laughs> oh, glass we gotta of wine. Do that. Yeah, for because sure. That, con that connectivity <clears throat> is so important to our happiness. So E is for engagement. A is for appreciation, gratitude, if you will. And the phrase I use is, this is good. And there's a number of ways to use that. T is for trust trusting the big picture that we can't see. And the phrase I use there is all will be well. This is what calms me when I can't sleep because I'm worried about this, that, or the other thing. H is kind of my special sauce for my acronym, and that's for humor. And all my work as an improv actor and a radio personality and stage actor and speaker, the saving and single parent, the saving grace is humor. Finding the humor in a situation when you can is makes life better, especially when you share a laugh. I'm not talking about laughing at people, but laughing with people. So that phrase is, isn't that interesting? <laughs> Instead of should, that should be different. And the final E is for esteem. And that's where the trust turns inward to yourself and your own strength and bravery. This also helps me sleep at night if I'm having unproductive anxiety. And that phrase is, whatever happens, I'll handle it somehow. Yeah. Yeah. I've yeah, I've used a phrase similar to that. You know, this too shall pass and mm -hmm. I'll get through it. Yeah. 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 Um, so so let me just ask, let's get out of this, this out of the way. You know, we hear about the law of attraction and positive thoughts attract positive things and negative thoughts. Attract. Is being happier now using those catchphrases anything like the law of attraction? 
I think I think to an extent, you know, there's two big movements in in the positive psychology movement that that are very popular. There's a lot to it. There's a lot of science. I did some research and stuck some science in the middle of each chapter, but I'm not a scientist and I don't have a PhD in positive psychology. But there's two things I notice which turn into um, obstacles in a way. And one is the law of attraction. I have a bit of a problem with, uh, I like to understand everything and take what works for me. I, I believe that positive energy begets positive energy. I do believe that if we're more positive and we can find a way to be happier, we'll have more energy to do good things in the world. But I don't take it to the extent that I have heard it taken, which is like, oh, all the people in New Orleans had bad energy and that's why Katrina happened. Like, I'm sorry, no. <laughs> you, you know, don't tell me my son caused his own schizophrenia because of his bad juju. Like that is, it's just too much for me. So like any movement, I don't buy into the extremes, but I do buy into, if you visualize it, it might happen. It might have a better chance of happening, or at least you'll have the pleasure of anticipating it, even if you don't turn out to be right. So I do believe in emanating positive energy. And that's about as far as I'll go with that. I don't think it's the secret to everything. I don't think we cause our own cancer. That's just me. Yeah. And the, the second thing is, is this, let's make happiness a competition. Who's happier than the other person? And the goal is to be happy all the time. And I'm going to force happiness on you. And I don't believe in that either. I don't believe that we are here to learn to be happier. I do believe that we are here to learn to meet the challenges that life is bringing us, but to meet those challenges with courage and energy and creativity and love and humor yeah. Yeah. and helping each other, learning and teaching. And if we can stay more positive and find a way to be less anxious and happier within ourselves, then we have the energy to make the world a little bit better or start a business or retire and find something else um, right. productive right. to do with our lives. So those are the two myths I bust. The goal is not to be happy 100% of the time, every minute of every day. That would be boring and wouldn't be life. And it's not and, honest. And it's not honest. Right, right. So we need to be authentic. So let's dig in to some of these um, okay. catchphrases. So we'll start with B, be here now. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I know it's not always possible, right? It's nice mm -hmm. when you're playing with your grandchild or you're eating a delicious meal or you're making love, you know, yeah. Yeah. Now, getting a massage. Right? Oh, yeah. that is very nice. But when you're having a bad day, mm -hmm. when the water pipes burst or when something terrible happens, being here now is not always advised even. Do you think that's true? I do. I do. And there's a part in my book where I address that. So, uh, you know, interestingly, they did this scientific study where they texted many, many, many people. It was a longitudinal study. It was a few years. And they would text people and say, what are you doing? What are you thinking about? How happy are you? Blah, 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 blah. And the upshot of that was that not being in the moment was a huge factor in not being happy overall. However, there are times when the toddler is screaming or you're getting a root canal or you're having a bad day or the pipes burst, burst where we do have to think ahead. We've got to call the plumber. We have to, you know, earn money for college. We have, we, you know, we have to think ahead to some extent. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we like to think back of, you know, people we've lost, people we've loved, um, times when we were a size five, I don't know, whatever, whatever <laughs> it is, but if we think mm -hmm. we can choose in the moment, if we're going to think ahead to a productive moment or to something like a road Scholar trip that we're anticipating, or we can think forward with anxiety. Right. Now, anxiety has its uses. If you need to call the plumber, you have to call the plumber. So right. that's productive anxiety. But once you put everything in place, 
and you're still worried, that's when anxiety becomes probably not the optimal choice of your moment. Which is when we might move to the next one, the R, right. which, which is, is the reality. And, and it is what it is. And I <laughs> use that so much. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I didn't make that up. That is out there. <laughs> many, many people use it. Yeah. It is what it is, is kind of the anti-should. Hmm. You know, and I think the the issue that I come up with when I speak to groups about this is always like, but I don't like what it is. <laughs> and my answer is a yeah. Acceptance that A is, well, the R is for reality, but, you know, it it's not, it is acceptance, but it's not necessarily approval. Mm-hmm. I will never approve of the fact that my son is ill. I will never approve of that, but I accept it. It is true. It is what it is. Right. And when I stay there, it kind of prunes away all the, well, it should be different and it, you're not, it's not fair. And you know, all those little toddler statements we say to ourselves. And I agree, it's not fair, but it is. And so it almost always leads me to now what? It's kind mm. of the serenity prayer. So when we're busy fighting reality, unless there's a purpose to it, um, it often is counterproductive or at least not productive, but it doesn't mean we have to like it. It just means, you know, and another way people say that as well, that happened, <laughs> you know, so. And the serenity prayer is also very helpful, you know, because I think it is what it is and the serenity prayer ad addresses I don't have control over this. Mm -hmm. You know, I can control what I can control. And right now, if it's a bad situation, it's how I feel about it, how I respond to it. So, right. yeah. So, right. That's I, a good I heard, one. Um, I used to travel the country talking about stress management. And um, one thing I learned is that when we don't like a situation, we really have four choices we can leave it, we can accept it exactly the way it is, or we can change the situation by changing something outward or change our inner feelings about it. Mm -hmm. That's really our choice. So it's not saying that if you're living with an abusive husband, you should go, oh, well, it is what it is. Right. You know, it is what it is. He is abusive. Then now what? What am now I going to do? Am I going to leave this? Am I going to ask for counseling? You know, what am I going to do? But if we don't accept it, and we, if you say, oh, well, he's not so bad. He didn't mean it this time. I had right. to, you know, end a marriage to an alcoholic a long time ago. It just tried everything under the sun, but it is what it is. He wasn't working on it. And so, yeah, so it is what it is. Doesn't mean we sit there and just go, bring it on. I'm Joe, right. you know. So. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So the the third the first E is harder for me, this engagement, okay. right? Why? So when I'm engaged with you, Randy, easy. When I'm engaged with my friends, easy. But when I'm engaged with people who are on the politically opposite side of the spectrum from me, who seem to me angry and irrational, much, much harder. So talk to me about that. Agreed. And I don't think this country is any more divided than it ever has been. I just think people have more permission to be disrespectfully vocal about it. Hold on. There's a bee in my studio. Go away. Okay. I'm hoping you won't sting me. Um, it is what it is. So <laughs> <laughs> go there in the corner, bee. So <clears throat> engagement is important. With that said, there are people we feel connected to more than others. So it doesn't mean that everybody gets an equal share, you know, love, we obviously want to spend more time with people we love, but when you're in a situation and there's something not to love about someone and you need to work with them or live with them or share a plane seat with them, it helps to know your limits and set your boundaries, but it also helps to find some common ground. Uh, I have a brother who is politically the total opposite of me. Oh, me and too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I have One that's, uh, you know, more feeling how I do and the other one who doesn't, who doesn't. And I don't post politically on this social media because no one's changing anybody's minds, unfortunately. And it's just a soapbox. So 
um, I called him up once and said, can we talk about this? I would like to listen to you and understand why you feel the way you feel. And I just listened. And, you know, there is an improv game where you listen or a communication, corporate communication game where you listen and you have to repeat back what they said before you get to say your thing and you have to make sure you got it right. So I listened and in a way I understood how he could feel the way he felt. And then I explained how I felt and he said, I don't agree with you. And I said, I don't agree with you, but, uh, you know, obviously I love you. How about we agree not, not to talk about this and just to talk about how much we love each other's kids and stuff. And that's what we've done. Yeah. On common yeah. ground. I, I always try to focus on, you know, as I say in the book, I think that family is what you embrace and who embraces you back. And there are members of your birth family who don't feel like family. And, you know, we set our boundaries, but we can almost always find a little bit of love somewhere to, to be with them as much as we need to be with them if we're in a situation together. Yeah. I understand members of Congress, Republicans and Democrats used to go out and have lunch together. Exactly. And, you know, and and talk about things. And it wasn't all about power. And, you know, we could go on a tangent here for, you know, <laughs> we but anyway, could go on a tangent. I can find that little bit of common ground in conflict in conflict resolution. That is almost always the first place to start. Yeah. You know, in other religions. We're all just trying to be good people. You know, I respect whatever your religion is. Just don't try to convert me because I'm happy with mine. Is that good? Right, good. Right. Let's move on. Yeah. yeah so, and at the at the end of the day, the we're all human beings. I mean, at least we have that yeah. in common, you know. So there is an area where we can find some connection, but we're it's, human. it's not probably, always easy. Maybe we grow a garden. We love our children. We want to belong. We make love. We, you know, I mean, there are things, but yes, there are certain people we feel more connected to than others and may prefer to spend more time with than others. And that's, that's human, but we're not always in a position to choose who we spend time with so we do our best to get along as best we can and appreciate, especially appreciate other people's jobs. It makes me, I hate that it makes me mad, but I feel angry when people go, oh, he's just a garbage man. I'm like, would you like your garbage person to quit? I mean, we need <laughs> right. each other. We need the, you know, I, I hate when people judge each other's vocations as not good enough. Even some of the goal-oriented literature out there, which is like, oh, quit that boring job and start your own business. It's like, wait a minute. I want my doctor's receptionist to stay at her board. <laughs> like, right. you know. right. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't judge and diss each other's choices as much as we do. Remember, we're all connected. So that's engagement. Right. And I think that's the happier part of it. Like when yeah. we feel you know, I respect, will. not judging and respectful. Mm -hmm. So I want to move on to appreciation, your A and yeah. breathe. And you share a story in there about uh, George and his wife. Yeah. And, and it's a beautiful story. Would you please yeah. share that? Absolutely. I, uh, I am a radio um, on-air talent. And right now I'm working for an NPR affiliate in Connecticut. I fill in for people. But when I was a full-time radio personality on a morning show, I got a lot of opportunities to MC charitable functions. And one group I worked with three or four years in a row was the AL ALS Association. And they're not about the research. They're about care of the patients to make their lives as meaningful as possible until that horrible disease takes over. And there was one couple I met and one year they, they'd been married ages and ages, had kids and the wife had ALS. And, and I remember one year she was dancing, but she couldn't move her arms. So I guess she had top down ALS. And then the next year she was in a wheelchair. And then the next year she was gone. And they sat me next to George. I think they were trying to fix us up, frankly, but, um, <laughs> you know, but it, that wasn't, you know, and I was chatting with him and I just said, you know, you must miss your wife so much. He goes, oh my God, I do. And I, I asked him, I said, can I ask you what it was like in between galas to, to take care of her? And he said, you know, I fell in love with my wife all over again when she had her illness. And I said, tell me more about that. And he said, you know, a lot of people say today's the first day of the rest of your life. I'm going to make a fresh start. When you have ALS, which is an illness where every day things are taken away from you physically. When you have ALS, 
you say instead, this might be the last day that I'm able to walk Mm -hmm. or talk or, uh, you know, type. And what we learn to do is just appreciate every day because it might be the last day we have that joy. And he said that his wife's attitude rubbed off on him and watching her find eat every like squeeze every bit of happiness out of what she might lose tomorrow made her even fall in love with her all over again. They never forgot to say this is good right now. That's just and, amazing. An yeah. amazing story and mm-hmm. what a great reminder. Whew. Yeah. And and part of that chapter also Randy is something that I used to do with my coaching clients. Mhm. And that is to write down at the end of the day, three good things. And, you know, it's, it's simple, but powerful because, uh, you know, the first time I heard it, I thought, oh, okay, three, well, I, I appreciate my children. You know, I love my parents. I like, yeah, you run out of those generalities after the second day, then you're like, well, now what? Now what? Now what? Right? (laughs) I know. So, so tell us more about that because I do like that and I do try and remember to do that. You know, this isn't in the book, but I'll share it. Uh, when I was a little girl and I don't know what book it was, but you know how sometimes a scene in a book stays with you and it was a story. All I remember is that this girl's grandfather said to her, at the end of the day, think of your mind as an attic and you're going to go up in the attic and you're going to sweep out the things that you don't want to dwell on and that you don't want to remember. And you're going to look at some treasured memories and you're going to put them up on the shelf and dust them off so that you can visit them anytime you want. Oh, because nice. there is scientifically proof that happiness rises when you anticipate something, when you have something to look forward to, and when you look back on happy memories. And life is what you highlight. You want to savor the best and then learn from the rest. That's a Randy K quote from the book. But <laughs> but that, you know, that's that attic. So with my kids at the end of the day, first of all, if someone's had a crummy day, you just say, well, you know, I'm so there's acceptance to that. Like I, I've had bad days and I just go, you know what? I'm just having one of those days. But that doesn't mean my life is terrible. It just means I'm having one of those days. And acceptance right. also means accepting your feelings as they are at the moment. Mm-hmm. At some point, it will help me at the end of the day to go, all right, there's got to there's got to be something good. And and there always is, you know, the the sunrise or I once spent a year my, with a paralyzed left leg. And every time I walk up the stairs unaided, that's a miracle to me. So that can always be a go-to for a good thing. But it does help to to highlight. If you take a, a page of text and you highlight all the negative words, imagine what's going to happen to your brain. If you take that same page of text and you highlight all the positive words and you glance at it, your energy level is going to go up. It's mm-hmm. just like kindness. Witnessing kindness, um, being the receiver or the giver of kindness raises our energy levels. So, you know, appreciation is noticing that this is good, doing three good things, or sometimes, you know, I always start gratitude lists and never finish them. So, uh, (laughs) you know, I keep them up for two days and then I'm like, but sometimes just saying to another person, like I will say to one of my grandchildren, this is already one of my favorite moments of the day. I just love playing Barbies with you. <laughs> and you see their face light up. It, you, it just cements it by mentioning it to another person. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be a gratitude list, but it can be just three times a day going, you know, this is good. Or and, you even know, I mean, reframing it, something bad. Yeah. And it can be simple stuff. You know, like I, I can crawl into my bed at night and go, oh, this feels so good. It's so nice yeah. and cozy, you know? Yeah. I mean, Oh, I love my warm shower. It yes. does, right? It doesn't have to be great big, huge, giant things. It's just appreciating mm-hmm. what is. Right, right. Yeah. And it is, a, it is a wonderful way, even when you're feeling down, to kind of refocus a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So thank you for putting that in there. And, and it was a reminder for me, too. Um, so in your description about trust, you say, all will be well, yeah. but maybe not in the moment, mm-hmm. right? And I appreciated that, Randy, because when you're in the middle of a crisis, I mean, 
a crisis like what you've dealt with with your son, mm -hmm. how do you even get to all will be well? It's not always easy. I know. And somebody, again, this is uh, something I picked up along the way, the simplest secret to happiness, some people say, is lower your expectations and raise your gratitude. Mm -hmm. So all will be well to me. And, and in the chapter, I go into faith and higher powers and God, and we all have our own concepts. And for some people, I know people have had what to me is the ultimate tragedy in losing a child, and they found their comfort in Jesus. Now, Jesus is not someone I, you know, is not in my religious wheelhouse, so to speak, but I, I totally saw how that trust helped them through this tragedy. Some people find trust and comfort in their community. So there's a lot of places to find trust. This is the kind of trust of trusting the other. Uh, and to me, the bigger picture that I don't know what it is. Mm. I don't know where my son's life will lead. It's certainly not what I dreamed of when he was a child. And by the way, I don't get to this acceptance overnight. It yeah. took a long time, but you know, he's having a um, sobriety relapse this week, which always wreaks havoc with his brain. And I let, I, I let myself absorb the sorrow of that. And then I could move on to say, all right, it is what it is. I don't like it, but it is what it is. But you know what? I, there's only so much I can do and all will be well, just maybe not the way I pictured it. Something's going to happen. He's either going to lose his housing and maybe hit bottom and get better, or he won't. Mm -hmm. And there's a, for me, there's a bigger picture that I can't see because I'm just a human being. And mm -hmm. I have to trust that other people might help him as well, that I'm going to help him as much as I can, that he might have the strength within himself because he just finished six months of sobriety and he slipped. So, so, you know, trusting all will be well, but I'm not really sure how. Yeah that just kind of helps me. And it's also in a littler way, like each of these phrases can lead you to an action and an action of trust might be as simple as letting your three-year-old set the table. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. So what if they put the forks on the wrong side? Right. All will be well, you know? Right. So it, it works and it's not all, it was not just all about God and this, it can be in little things. It can be the manager that delegate some things to other people and trust that they'll do the job well. So all will be well involves trusting other people, trusting some sort of higher power or plan that we don't know. And it comforts me and I hope it comforts you. And it takes time for the results. It does take time. Too. Yeah. And that's one of the uh, kind of through phrase, through lines in your book is mm -hmm. that, you know, happier uh, goes up and down and it's not an, a constant thing. And it, some things take more time than others. And yeah. we just have to trust at some point that it all will be well. Yeah. I mean, these are interchangeable and connected, you know, mm -hmm. so it's like, you know, it is what it is and all will be well are kind of connected. So I sort of like pick the one you need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Seven phrases and which one's working for you. Take that one. <laughs> <laughs> and you are the, you know, the humor expert, right? So I personally get hooked into stuff, get very personally, emotionally charged up and wow, to stop and go, well, isn't that interesting <laughs> when I'm ready to punch my brother in the face or something? Yes, that's the perfect use of that phrase. <laughs> you know, my, I want to punch my brother. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? I could get my grandkids to do that, but they're six, four and a half and three and a half. So we're working on it. <sighs> yeah, it's, uh, you know, and this is what I found. One of the other reasons I wrote the book is that, you know, I, you know, I love to learn. I'm not in search of, you know, some guru on a mountain, but I, I love to learn. So I took Kabbalah classes and I studied positive psychology and I found, and I went to happiness clubs and I found not overall, but a fair amount of the time, nobody was funny. Like <laughs> nobody was smiling. Nobody was cracking jokes. I think the Dalai Lama, I've seen him giggle, but you know, <laughs> I grew up where humor helps you cope. And you know, when I was a morning radio personality, 
you know, trauma aside, we're not talking about, you're not going to joke about your dog dying in the morning, but if your heel breaks on the way down the aisle in your wedding, I'm sorry, that's funny. Maybe not at the moment, but by tomorrow morning, it would be funny. And so right. what I learned to do was laugh sooner whenever I could. Yeah. And, and the key, to, the key to humor is curiosity. Oh, mm. is it? Isn't that interesting? And it even goes to having a sense of humor about yourself. Yeah. That I think I've shared with you when we've had previous conversations that in between husband one, alcoholic, and husband two, nice guy I wouldn't have looked at in high school, uh, was 16 <laughs> years of things Randy had to learn. I call it relationship high school. And part of what I had to learn was treating myself with the same acceptance and humor that I like to treat other people with. And so I started to look at what I thought were failings and go, everyone likes to cook for their boyfriend, but I don't. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> and as, and then I went, isn't that adorable? That's just a little, a little quirk about me. And that helped me accept myself with all my failings and help me be ready for a relationship. So humor, and I know we're running out of time. I, okay. I'm still, I'm still going because I okay. love this conversation. I want to so, be mindful of you be here now. Okay. Oh yes. But let's, let's cover the last one. Whatever happens, I'll handle it somehow. And and that also goes back to the trust and that it is what it is, but it's, it's one of those that takes more time. So just kind of yeah. blow that one up for us a little bit. So that is the uh, final E for esteem. And this is where your trust turns inward. So when we have unproductive anxiety, which is you've already changed the batteries and the smoke alarms, you have an alarm system, you have a plan if there should be a fire, you've blown out the candles, you've done everything you can so your house won't burn down. And you still stay up at night worrying what if the house burns down. That's unproductive anxiety because it's not going to lead you to any more actions that can prevent the problem. And we do this all the time. Oh, what if I blow the speech? What if um, I catch COVID? I mean, what if... And all we can do is prepare, do the work as best we can, but ultimately we're on the top of that precipice going, it still could go wrong, but it could go right. You know, I have prepared, I've done everything I can. I don't know what's going to happen, but whatever happens, I know I will handle it somehow. Mm -hmm. If you... I, I know there are comments, so I, I know this is live and people might be here. So if you're with us now or watching this as a replay, think of something that you have survived in your life. Something you didn't think you could if it happened. I bet you got a few, Wendy, right? I got a few. I got a few too. I mean, to me, it's like, I'm all, all you know, as long as my kids are healthy, I'm happy. Well, lo and behold. Right. Right. So you know, as long as I have use of my arms and legs, I'll be happy. Well, for a year I didn't, you know, so, and I was lucky, so, so lucky to, that the nerve grew back and I can use the leg again. So if you think of things you thought you couldn't survive and you're still here to tell the tale, then you're stronger than you think and you're braver than you think and you handle stuff. Yeah. And whatever happens, we'll handle it. You'll handle it somehow. That's it. Yeah. And that helps me because it gets me away from, oh, that won't happen. That won't happen. Yes, it will. No, it won't. I'm like, I don't know. It might rain tomorrow. It might not. I might forget the lyrics of the song and I might not. I'm going to go <laughs> over them again. But I know this. If I do forget my lyrics, I'm going to think of something on the spot. And that has happened to me. I don't know what I said, but I didn't stay on the stage forever going. Ooh, blah, 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 blah. I forgot my yeah. Name. And, uh, you know, like we're both we're both were single moms at one point, you know, right. and I remember when I went back to school and I was like, how am I going to feed my kids? You know, it's peanut butter and jelly every night or ramen noodles, <laughs> you know, and I would lie in bed thinking, how am I going to pay the electric bill? You know, what if they turn off the power? It's cold. And I would be like, no, I got this. I, I got this. I will figure this out somehow. Yeah. And so I think, yeah. you know, when you trust yourself, too, yes. and and are willing to ask for help sometimes. Right, um, all of that plays in together. What a great book, Randy! I wish we Thank could talk you. for another hour, but we do have to wrap up. So, give me two or three takeaways for the Hey Boomer audience that's trying to live their best life in this next chapter. Okay, takeaway number one: 
it's not a competition. You're not supposed to be happy every single hour, every single second of the day. But if you can be happier and find ways to get lost in pleasure instead of lost in anxiety, you will have more energy to revitalize, reach your goals, teach people, learn from people. Remember, we're here to learn to meet the challenges with love and humor and courage and creativity and finding ways to tell yourself the right thing will help you stay happier. The other takeaway is, are we our stories or are we the way we reacted to our stories? Mm. In your story, are you the victim or the victor? Are you a sad sack or are you strong? It's all in the way you tell your story. I can tell the story about my leg, how lucky I am that I can walk again, or I could tell you how sad I am that I can't run again. It's how you tell it. And then give yourself a break because nobody's perfect. We're here to learn. And if we can learn how to be a little bit happier and part of our legacy, like the wonderful people Wendy spoke about in the Never Too Old stories, if part of our legacy is to make the world our little corner a little bit better, we can do that a little bit better if we're a little bit happier. Randy, you're great. Thank you. Um, people are saying they want your book. So let's let's offer a giveaway. Okay. Um, so if if you would like to get a copy of Randy's book as a gift from Randy, um, here's what you need to do. You need to invite people to subscribe to Hey Boomer. So go to the website. The uh, Let me show you. Heyboomer.biz. Go to the website, subscribe, and get your friends to subscribe to the email because that's one of the ways that we help to grow the show and grow the audience. Um, once... We reach Friday. I will look to see who has subscribed and how many, and then we'll pick a winner. Okay. So thank you. And that you, can Randy. be a paperback or um, an ebook. You you can decide. Okay. So, Perfect. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Let me show people how to find you. So you can go to Randy's website at Randy R A N D Y E K K A Y E dot com. And she also has a website for this book, happiermadesimple.com. And I'm sure you can get a copy of the book through Randy directly yeah. from that. Rather well, than actually, it just leads you to Amazon. It just ah. leads you to the links. Um, it's available as an audiobook as well. I am, that is a booth back there. I'm an audiobook narrator as well. So uh, you can get the audiobook, the ebook, or the paperback. And if you like it, I would love it if you said so on Amazon. But I, Absolutely. you know, just wish you happiness or more happiness. Thank you. Thank you. So next week is going to wrap up our month of talking about health and healthy living. And my guest for next week is Bernadette Wagner from Primetime for Women. Bernadette started researching aging healthfully and recognized the importance of social connections on physical and emotional well-being, right? Mm -hmm. Bernadette says, you are in your prime if you see the second half of life as time to explore new possibilities, discover new passions, and express who you are at your core. Doesn't that sound like what we talk about on Hey Boomer? I love it. I know. And she is she's dynamite. So she, that'll be a fun show. If you want to support the work that we are doing here at Hey Boomer, here's a couple of ways you can do it. Subscribe to the email list. Invite your friends to subscribe to the email list. Uh, subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts or or um Stitcher Wherever you get or podcast, Spotify, Google. right? And review it and leave a comment. Let people know. Support our sponsor, roadscholar.org slash heyboomer. Go to their site. Look at some of their trips. You'll definitely get your appetite wet if you do that. And share the show with your friends. Let them know they can watch the recording. They can listen on podcast. All of that will be helpful to Hey Boomer. So thank you for joining today. I know your time is valuable and I so appreciate that you chose to spend it with us. And remember that I want you to live with passion, live with relevance and live with courage. And we are never too old to set another goal or dream a new dream. My name is Wendy Green 
and this has been 